I was just a young woman in my early 20s when it all began. A series of emails, seemingly harmless at first, but eventually turned into a constant torment that went on for over a decade. I want to share this story as a cautionary tale in hopes that it will help someone else. I had always considered myself an ordinary person leading an ordinary life. My friends and family were my world, and my career was blossoming. But one harmless email on my 22nd birthday changed everything. It was a simple message, signed only as a friend. The email wished me a happy birthday and asked how I was planning to celebrate. At first, I thought it was just a friendly gesture from someone I knew, perhaps an old acquaintance. Looking back, I kicked myself in the butt for being so naive. I replied with gratitude, saying I was planning a small get-together with friends. I asked, who's this? Hoping to identify the sender. The response came quickly, just as before, with no name attached. The email said, I'd love to take you on a date someday. What do you think? It was odd, but not alarming. I thought maybe it was a friend playing a joke. So, I replied, thank you, but I don't think so. Who are you? As the years went by, the emails continued on each of my birthdays. A friend never revealed their identity but persisted in asking for a date. The messages remained friendly, but a creeping sense of unease settled in the back of my mind. At first, I shrugged it off as harmless, but the persistence and anonymity began to concern me. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me, even though I had no evidence to support it. By the time I reached my 30s, these annual messages had become an unwelcome tradition. My friends told me to block the sender, and I did. Blocking the sender did very little to help as the creep just created another email address and continued on. Then, on my 33rd birthday, something changed. The email was no longer a simple request for a date. This time, it contained a detailed description of my plans for the day including where I'd be having dinner with friends. Chills ran down my spine. How could this person possibly know the specifics of my birthday celebration? Panic set in as I realized that someone was not only watching me from afar, but also following my movements closely. I contacted the police, who took the situation seriously. They traced the email, but a friend had covered their tracks well. The investigation hit a dead end, and I was advised to take precautions, but not to let fear control my life. The annual messages continued, growing increasingly intrusive. A friend knew more about my life than I was comfortable with, and the emails began to mention places I had been and people I had met. Every year, I replied, pleading for the person to reveal their identity and to stop this torment but they only responded with vague promises of a future meeting. My life became a cycle of fear and anxiety. I changed my email address, my phone number, and even moved to a new apartment. But a friend always found a way to contact me, no matter how hard I tried to escape. I went back to the police and pleaded with them to help me, but this time they told me that there was not much else they could do. They said that technically, the sender of the email had not done anything alarming. The officers I spoke with felt that the emails were harmless and said that if the sender wanted to harm me, he would have done it already. I was told to just be aware of my surroundings and that I should make another report if the creepy guy did something more threatening. I couldn't believe that the police wouldn't help me. I felt so helpless and lost all hope in the justice system that was supposed to serve and protect me. I wondered what this creep would have to do for my complaint to be taken seriously. My friends and family were very supportive and did their best to comfort me, but it did very little to ease the constant fear I was living in. Soon, the creepy sender of the emails began contacting me on random days throughout the year. It wasn't just on my birthday. 
the emails seemed to be getting more and more desperate and demanding as he begged me to meet with him. I decided it was time to stop responding to the messages. I felt like my responses were encouraging his behavior even though my responses were far from friendly. The more I ignored him, the more persistent he became. One day he sent me an email that terrified me to my core. The email created a new type of fear I had never felt before. I now began fearing for my life. The email detailed the changes that I had made in my personal life and physical appearance. The sender told me that no matter where I went, he would find me and that there was nowhere in this world that I could hide. That night, I couldn't sleep. I decided to do some digging of my own, hoping to find any evidence that would uncover who the emails were coming from. I scoured social media, public records, and any available information on the closest people to me. My search turned up empty and after that, I felt exhausted and even more hopeless. Paranoia began to set in, and I felt I could no longer trust the people in my social circle. I began to withdraw from my friends who had called me for months inviting me to social gatherings. I just couldn't bring myself to leave home unless it was necessary. After all, it seemed the creep had photographs of every social gathering or outing I attended. Just the thought of someone following me around everywhere I went and getting close enough to take pictures of me was enough to keep me out of public spaces. Whenever I went out, I wondered if the waiter at a restaurant or the Uber driver was my stalker. I felt safer at home, with the doors locked and the curtains drawn, he couldn't get to me. Self-isolation was beginning to affect my mental health and I felt trapped in my own home. I decided it was time to speak to a therapist. During the first meeting with my therapist, we didn't speak much about my stalker. I had to be sure I could trust her first, so we just focused on the fact that I felt lonely and isolated. I met with the therapist in her office once a week, and by the third session, we had begun speaking about the reasons why I felt isolated. We spoke about my stalker and together we created a plan to help me overcome the feelings I had associated with the whole ordeal. The therapy sessions had helped me to think more clearly and one day a light bulb had suddenly gone off as I thought some more about who this person could be. Not many people knew my new address, email, and other details. Only a handful of people had this new information and I created a list of all those people and began investigating each one by one. The prime suspect on my list was someone I had known for just about 10 years. This was someone I had confided in about my stalker. This was someone I considered somewhat of a friend. The someone was my landlord who we will call Mr. Wilson. I had met Mr. Wilson about 10 years earlier when he became my landlord. Mr. Wilson was an older man in his late 40s who was married with a wife and three small children. He was a good landlord who I paid rent to on time and who always fixed any repairs I needed. He was always friendly, but I noticed that he was extra nice to me, perhaps slightly nicer to me than the other tenants. I thought nothing of it though, it's normal for a landlord to have a favorite tenant and like I said, I always paid my rent on time. Of all the people on my list of suspects, it seemed Mr. Wilson had the least to gain from stalking me. I couldn't think of a motive for this behavior, but he was the only person who had access to the secure building I lived in to take pictures of me in the hallway of the building. Also, when pictures were taken with me hanging out, the other suspects were present and couldn't have taken pictures of themselves hanging out with me at a distance. The second building I moved into was also owned by Mr. Wilson, so he obviously knew where I lived unlike my friends who hadn't yet visited my new apartment. My friends didn't even have my email address because we communicated via text. However, Mr. Wilson had my email address which he used to communicate with me about repairs, rent, etc. Suddenly, I remembered that on almost every birthday, 
Mr. Wilson would be at the apartment building and had asked me if I had plans. I unsuspectingly told him what my plans were and never thought it was strange for him to be at the building he owned. On a few occasions, he even suggested restaurants and hangout spots to me. I thought nothing of it because he told me that I shared the same birthday with one of his children which was the reason he remembered mine. Finally, the stalking had begun at around the same time I moved into the first apartment building owned by Mr. Wilson. None of the other suspects on my list knew me for 10 years which ruled them out. After concluding that Mr. Wilson was my stalker, I was panicked and overcome with fear. I had confided in this man about my stalker. It was the reason I had to pack up my entire apartment and move, which he was aware of. I couldn't prove with certainty that Mr. Wilson was my stalker, and I knew that if I wanted the police to take action, I would need solid proof. I hired a private investigator who agreed to take on my case and to help me catch Mr. Wilson in the act. A week into the investigation of my landlord, the private investigator discovered that Mr. Wilson had a history of odd behavior. He had been involved in several disputes with his family, and rumors circulated about his infidelity. But none of it proved that he was a friend. I was torn between confronting Mr. Wilson and continuing to seek answers through the investigator. But deep down, I feared what might happen if I accused an innocent man. One day, I decided to take a risk. I replied to the latest email, saying, If you ever cared about me, you'll stop this now. I can't live like this anymore. Please, I'm begging you. To my surprise, the response came swiftly. It simply said, I'm sorry. After a few months, the investigation found nothing that led to Mr. Wilson being the culprit. I decided to terminate my lease, so I sent him an email to let him know. His response was odd, he seemed a bit annoyed. He referred to the lease that stated that if I wanted to terminate my lease early, I would have to pay a penalty. I told him that I was happy to do that, and he insisted on knowing why I was terminating my lease. I didn't respond to his email, I packed some of my things and left the apartment to stay with a friend for a few days until I figured out where I would be going next. One evening, while I returned to the apartment to pack the remainder of my belongings, I received a knock on my door. It was Mr. Wilson, looking visibly distraught. He asked to speak with me, and my heart raced as I invited him inside. With trembling hands, Mr. Wilson finally admitted that he had been a friend. He explained that he had become infatuated with me from afar, a twisted obsession that had grown over the years. Tears streamed down his face as he confessed to following my life through emails, feeling a connection that he couldn't understand or control. He apologized for the torment he had put me through, claiming that he had finally realized the pain he had caused. Mr. Wilson's admission shattered the image I had of my landlord. I couldn't comprehend how a seemingly ordinary man could become so consumed by obsession. I decided not to involve the authorities, as Mr. Wilson was genuinely remorseful and had sought therapy to address his issues. I hoped that he would find the help he needed to move forward and regain control over his life. As for me, I moved out of the apartment without having to pay the extra fees to terminate my lease. I didn't offer Mr. Wilson a forwarding address for my mail, and I changed my email address and phone number when I moved. In time, I found the strength to forgive, not for Mr. Wilson's sake, but for my own. Holding on to anger and fear would only keep me in prison in the past. On the day of my 34th birthday, I reluctantly opened my inbox and was pleasantly surprised to find that there were no creepy emails waiting for me. The annual emails never returned, and I finally felt a sense of freedom. My life was mine to live, and I was determined to make the most of it. Now, I am careful about who I let into my space and who I call a friend.
make sure to like and subscribe for more stories. Remember, stay spooked. <laughs>